on behalf of Art at Watson, I wanted to welcome you to the opening of this very special exhibition. I'm Sarah Baldwin. I am co-chair with Joanne Hart, who I hope will join us. Here she is. <laughs> Perfect timing. Joanne Hart, other co-chair of the Art at Watson Committee. We are a group of Watson staff and community members who have been bringing art into the Watson Institute for more than 10 years now. And you might wonder why art in a social sciences center. And it's because we believe that there are many ways of understanding the world. And data is one, and science is one, but art is one too. And we also believe that there are maybe are more than 40, almost 50 exhibitions by now, have sparked conversations that would not have taken place um, if the walls had been bare. So before I forget, I wanted to invite everybody to a reception following the conversation. Um, you can enjoy the artwork and uh, get to know the artist and the curator. So today is the opening of a very special exhibition that's been almost two years in the making. But I'm gonna invite Holly Schaefer to tell you about it. Holly is the Robert Gale Noyes Assistant Professor of Humanities and an Assistant Professor of History of Art and Architecture here at Brown. And she specializes in 18th and 19th century art and architecture, architecture in South Asia, Britain, and the British Empire, which makes her the perfect person to do the introducing. She's going to do that right now. So um, thanks again for coming, everybody, and please welcome Holly. Thank you so much, Sarah and Joanne, and welcome to everyone here for this kind of remarkable opening of this exhibition. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to be one of many welcoming you here. Um, so I'm Holly Schaefer. I'm a professor in history of art and architecture and an affiliate of the um, Saxena Center for Contemporary South Asia. And it's been an immense pleasure to work with Manor Hussein, the, uh, the artist Manor Hussein, the curator, Naim Vibora, who is also uh, a graduate student in our department, and Sarah Baldwin, who is a founding member and co-chair of Art at Watson to bring these amazing paintings and the powerful stories of loss, hope, desire, and the constraints of society that Manor visualizes to the Watson. I'd also like to thank uh, key helpers who made this exhibition possible, Joanne, uh, co-chair of Art at Watson, Carl Smith, brilliant installer, uh, as, as, um, as Sarah wrote, uh, installer extraordinary, very true, and Christy Kilgus, John Matza, Alexander Laferriere, and Pete Bilderback, who are all members of Watson's uh, fabulous uh, communications team. So just to set the stage, Manor's work draws together the practice of Indo-Persian miniature painting, which you can see in one of her films that we'll be seeing in this conversation, with digitization. It also asks us to look at the challenges uh, people face regarding fertility, mental health, and well-being, and that those challenges are both private and public, and often at war with one another, as Mahnoor and Naimvi both poignantly discuss in their respective artistic and curatorial statements. We can immerse ourselves in these works, their moods and emotions, sorrows, and immense imagination in the exhibition, which I encourage you to see again and again. Today, we are very lucky to be introduced to the work through Manor and Nainvi, who will be in conversation. And in order to do that, I will briefly introduce them. So Manor Hussein is a visual artist born in Lahore, Pakistan. She earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree with first class honors from the esteemed National College of Arts in Lahore in 2009 with a specialization in Indo-Persian miniature painting. And she was recognized with the Renard and Ibrahim Excellence Award for her outstanding work. Hussein has cultivated a diverse professional background that includes teaching advanced art and design, establishing a fashion accessories brand, which we all should <laughs> be uh, participating in, and contributing illustrations for an interactive English language learning tool. Her artistic endeavors have garnered international attention, and she has participated in numerous art shows at home and abroad. 
Notably, her work has been featured in Milan at an art exhibition held by Moulin de, de l'Est, forgive my uh, accent, an esteemed Parisian cultural society dedic dedicated to showcasing South Asian contemporary art. And there are many more instances of um, her, uh, her work at uh, fabulous exhibitions. Hussein's work in Indo-Persian miniature painting is characterized by a modern authenticity melded with traditional elements. Her realistic yet ironic approach delves into emotional themes, portraying the contemporary human psyche amidst a world of novelties. And now she is based in, we're very lucky, in Rhode Island uh, here. Nine Vivora is pursuing her PhD in the history of art and architecture at Brown, at Brown, and she specializes in South Asian modern and contemporary art. She received her MA in art history from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a postgraduate diploma in museology and conservation from Mumbai University. Her research on Jitish Kalat's planetary visions during the COVID-19 pandemic was recently published, and many congratulations on this, in Kala Bhavana's annual journal, Nandan 2023. So I encourage you all to read that. She has a background working as a curatorial assistant at the Jahangir Nicholson Art Foundation, which formulates the South Asian modern art wing at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahalaya in Mumbai. She researched exhibition catalogs for The Journey is the Destination, the, um, the artist journey between then and now in 2016, which featured a number of um, key South Asian contemporary artists and traced their art practices through different phases. Currently, she is researching South Asian women sculptors who played a pivotal role in the rise of modernism in the post-colonial moment. She is interested in global modernisms, questions surrounding decoloniality, and worldly affiliations in South Asian modern and contemporary art. And it is now a great honor to turn the mics over to them to walk us through and tell us about their work. Thank you, Holly, for such a um, generous introduction. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to thank Holly Schaefer for putting me and Manur in touch with each other. Um, and I would also like to thank Sarah Baldwin, who's been kind of the backbone of this project. Um, and of course, the Watson Center, um, and uh, Saxena Center for Contemporary South Asia uh, that gives us this opportunity to meet uh, each other on this land, uh, being from the same subcontinent. Uh, so thank you all very much for being here. Um, I would like to start this evening with uh, a video presentation that highlights the materiality of um, the traditional Indo-Persian style uh, it is important to sort of delve into this and understand it before we uh, ask Manur about her contemporization.
So I guess we got a glimpse of um, a little bit about the process of the uh, traditional Indo miniature Persian style of painting. Um, so Manu started her journey with these um, kind of food motifs, and uh, she creates these allegorical portraits. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Manur, that what inspired you to transition from uh, these food works into the feminine form? I feel like I should have done the thank yous before, but I'm so used to Zoom meetings now. For a minute, I thought my mic was <laughs> mute. Uh, but uh, so basically, this is my thesis work. Um, and it was, I'm from a city in Pakistan, Lahore is the name of the city. And it's very rich culturally. It's like you have a lot of architecture, but what people don't really know is that we're also the food central. We take our food very seriously. So it was only natural that um, I wanted to kind of see the connection because, you know, that's how we connect through people. Uh, we, through food, we connect to people. That's how we make, you know, um, that's our way of showing love and care and everything. So it was natural that I kind of wanted to see what's the connection there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the darker side was like, you know, mm -hmm. mental health related to eating disorders. Um, there was anxiety and depression and a lot of obesity related stuff. Um, so that's where my thesis started and that's where the mm -hmm. food series started. Um, but as far as it developing into uh, the feminine spirit, this is also one of my pieces from the thesis. It's called Mother and Child Bond. Um, so I feel like it was already there, like the feminine point of view was already there in my work. What really brought it uh, to the forefront was probably my uh, struggles with fertility related issues. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, it, this image is a perfect segue to kind of, you know, introduce how the transition happened for me. Um, and you also transition into the digitization of the traditional technique. So would you relate both the body form, the woman's form, and this process of digitization? Um, how would you kind of um, tell us more about these kind of themes? Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the powerful essence of the feminine spirit in your work? You know, honestly, before I had the word feminism in my vocabulary, I think I was already one, you know? So um, a lot of these words were introduced later on to kind of put names to experiences that you're already going through. Um, so what, how I, this is like a funny story. So I moved to the US with my husband. Um, it's been 10 years, we've been here now. Um, and initially it was really difficult getting the materials to and fro from Lahore to, you know, we were in Chicago at that time. Um, it's like a squirrel hair brush, the paper is very special, so just like, you know, traveling to and fro, kind of getting all of that together was a bit of a struggle. Um, and then how it happened was a friend of mine was writing a book, a book of poems, and she wanted me to illustrate it for her. And at that point, that's when the iPad came into my life. <laughs> so that was my first um, interaction with digital work. Mm -hmm. um, so after that, I was like, OK, this is interesting. I'm going to you know, experiment some more with this. And then the series started where I was taking traditional miniature paintings from the Badshah Nama or the Shah Nama. And then I was painting portraits of more like people I knew, contemporary versions of it. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I think I'm going to, oh wait. That's where the we have like the <laughs> picture with the Jhangi being replaced by a female. So, um, and from there it just kind of started because it was so convenient. Um, also like just realizing that the world is changing and I'm not really sitting in Changi's court anymore, being Payag and painting those images. So kind of like just keeping up with the times. It just seemed really important to bring the art form to a time where it's more relatable, you know? Yeah, and so um, there's this sense of duality in your work. So mm. post the this particular uh, portrait that we're looking at, uh, the previous slide, uh, we yeah, now we transition into this uh, into which 
uh, it's as if you're having this internal conversation with yourself. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, th this? I yeah. feel like that's a constant. Like It's just constantly going through things you do. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that's the same for everyone and it's not just me. But you do kind of have a voice in your head and you're, you know, like every time you do something, you're, you know, thinking about it. So that, but in this specific piece, what happened was um, this was more about my anxieties related to uh, infertility. And then also like I kind of found this pattern in my way of thinking where I was like, okay, you know, just being very calm. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, anxiety sets in and it was, I think it was me trying to talk myself through it. And that just created such an interesting dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the more I became conscious of it, the more I realized that it's actually a really commonly, you mm -hmm. know, done thing in my life. Like I'm always in my head, I'm always talking to myself. So, um, and that, again, like borrowing vocabulary, um, so we studied some, in college, we studied some Freudian theory, mm -hmm. which actually gave me insight into, you know, the id, the ego, the superego. So again, I had words to use um, with, you know, the emotions that I was already feeling, and that just played out in the, into the imagery. Um, so in this particular work, can you tell us more about the symbolism? Um, I mean, it's almost like the id or your id is speaking to its super ego and is in conversation with each other. But I can see other elements of the miniature within this work. So, um, yeah. So I think for me, it's very difficult to disconnect. Like miniature painting is something that I'm just intrinsically drawn to. So it's like, even if I've contemporized it, it's still got the elements, like I still borrow elements from it, like with the patterns and even this whole scenario, you will see in Mughal miniatures, there are a lot of pictures where, you know, this is a setting that's very familiar. Mm -hmm. um, even with the imagery of the sun, um, that's also from medieval times. Um, that's how they, you know, with the celestial bodies and everything. So a lot of the icons and the imagery I've used is um, from, miniature painting from the past, and then just making it more relevant to my experience, and then also in hopes of like connecting mm -hmm. uh, with people with similar experiences. Mm -hmm. Sure, so um, moving on from this uh, work. Um, it, no. Yeah, so in this particular piece, um, we come back to it because I think it's one of Manur's foundational works before she transitioned uh, into this digitization process, um, wherein on the right uh, is the portrait, a uh, 17th century portrait of Shah Jahan on horseback. And she very vividly like replaces this portrait with the woman on horseback, but she retains all the other elements within the work, um, including the halo and um, the foreground and the background. Uh, so can you tell us uh, what inspired you to uh, sort of create this work? So I think I've always struggled with the representation of women in art. Um, and there, it's not like they didn't exist. There's so many stories that you hear of. There's Rani of Chansi. And you know, so we know that there were women who were very much warriors at that time, but you don't really see paintings of them. And when I did bring it up, everyone was like, oh, but you have representation of gopis and the queen and the princesses. Um, but that's also represented through a male gaze. It's not a woman artist representing the life of women. Hmm. So that was something that's, it's really like, you know, it's a big thing if you think about it but all the images that we're familiar with are created by men. There's actually, you know, mm -hmm. so there's no representation of actually women controlling their own narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where this was, the inspiration for this image came from. Um, what I did do was that there are birds in the original image that I swapped with origami cranes, which is a sign of hope, which was kind of like my way of showing that you know there's hope for the future and it's not too late to change that mm -hmm. um and yeah that's basically how it started 
Yeah, so it's sort of uh, this new image of yours sort of reverses these gender roles, and especially within um, the context of portraiture. And it kind of uh, reverses this kind of stereotypical imagery of, um, uh, you know, of an emperor on horseback. Um, and then coming back to the psychoanalytic lens, we can even say that this new vision of the portrait, uh, Manu's new vision for this portrait probably um, is her alter ego or her id uh, that asserts herself as this warrior, um, you know. Um, but uh, moving on, um, I would like to uh, ask you more about these cranes. So, you know, there are a lot of different influences uh, like um, the clouds, uh, you know, within your work, which I think are inspired by Chinese art or uh, these, cra these origami cranes. So can you tell us more about these global influences that you have in your art? So when Barber um, invaded South Asia, he brought all of these influences with him. So you have like in miniature, traditional miniature painting, you will see Chinese influences. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to see Iranian influences, the Persian, you know, all of that is like combined. And that's, I think, the interesting part about art. Um, you know, it's like slowly evolves. It's like a journey, you know, wherever you go, it picks up some of the stuff, it absorbs it, and then you move forward. So that would be the clouds. The cranes were like just stories that I had wrote. That's like a personal representation. Um, that's more of stories of this Japanese um, myth, I would say, um, where this girl who was recovering from cancer mm -hmm. and her friends would come and see her in the hospital and they would be like, you know, if you fold a thousand cranes, that's mm -hmm. like good luck and all your wishes, what you wish for will come true. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like a universal representation of like hope and, you know, that's how I've incorporated it in my work. Um, and there are several works uh, as after like probably this talk is over that you can navigate outside and spot these little cranes everywhere. And so can you tell us uh, or show uh, are there more images of the cranes that we can see here? Um, I don't think we have no. more images. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so let's talk more about this, uh, this very inspiring work uh, that um, Manur uh, came across. So Manur, how are you inspired by this work and what does it uh, represent? Yeah. So coming back to the representation, I think this is the problem that really bugged me about it. This is about Rustam. And apparently he was like a big baby. He's like a legendary hero in Persian mythology and they were struggling with the birth. So the father was told by this imaginary big bird that, okay, you know, this is how you're going to perform a C-section. But what I love most about this image is like the pose the lady has. Like, I'm pretty sure that's not how you're going to look like when you're going through a C-section. <laughs> and, you know, while looking at it, you're almost like wincing a little. At least I'm sure the ladies are. Um, but see, that's the problem with representation. Like if women who go through the experience aren't going to be able to portray it in its realistic form, it's not really giving the complete story. You know, you're just like, it's just scratching the surface, right? Like you're not really getting the true idea or essence of what the experience is like. And therefore, I feel like art becomes a sort of meditative practice for you, a kind of an internalization almost, you know, wherein you are breaking free from like the stronghold of society. So, um, yeah, I mean, can you tell us more about what is the most ideal place? What does your studio look like while you are painting? Oh my God, that's uh, a lot to unpack there. So <laughs> art for me is never like a very planned format or an organized way of like, okay, this is what I'm gonna create. A lot of the times I just like start painting and it's like inside into myself and I see it reflected on the paper and I'm like, okay, this is what's happening. So in a way it's, I let the art lead me and it's more of a, let's see, go with the flow and let's see where we're at currently. Um, my studio space is like my favorite space ever. 
<laughs> but my husband's trying to steal it away from me because he's setting up his music studio there. So we're still kind of like struggling over the, you know, <laughs> the space. But it's definitely meditative. Like once I'm there, there are times when you don't even like realize that you have to have a meal. And, you know, it's just like I don't realize if it's like daytime or night. It's you're so immersed in what you're creating. Um, and I love that feeling, honestly. Like it's just very therapeutic. So what next? What is Manur's next oh vision? God. Yeah. After this uh, process of, so we saw the food, you know, the food works, the portraits, the allegorical portraits. Now we are looking at the feminist form, the body form. Uh, what is the future of uh, Manur's work? Honestly, Nenvi, your guess is as good as mine, I'm going <laughs> to say. <laughs> um, but, you know, there... You can't say that there's not enough going around in the world. There's so much happening. And there's so many issues that I feel very strongly about. Um, so it's something's going to come up. It is going to evolve. But I like the surprise element for me also. Like, you know, let's see where it takes me. But um, yeah. Lastly, I would uh, like to uh, uh, direct everybody to see this very special eight foot tall uh, portrait that Manur has created called The Egg. Uh, it kind of amalgamates everything that this show is about because it takes us through this kind of symbolism, the psychoanalytic lens. It also takes us through the uh, geometric abstraction that Manur uses uh, within uh, the miniature style that she's inspired by. So, uh, Manur, um, would you just like to tell us before uh, we end uh, more about this work called The Egg and what does it mean for you? So, geometric patterns have been a part of Islamic art since mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. Um, it's basically portraying divinity and the endless, like the infinite uh, love of God. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think I tried to use that also in my imagery and kind of create, again, like coming back to that's like a hopeful way of viewing mm -hmm. things. Um, we don't really talk much about um, fertility issues. And I think I realized that when I started talking about it to people and everyone was like, oh, we went through a similar experience. And I'm like, why aren't you talking about it then? Um, so I think it's really important to kind of open this space, a safe space for people to actually converse about things that really matter and make that connection mm -hmm. so you know we can actually do something about it and not feel so alienated and you know um, kind of foster that community support mm -hmm. that you need when you're going through stuff like that um, so the egg is also a representation of that with like mm -hmm. freezing eggs and you mm -hmm. know going through that whole experience mm -hmm. again like that's mm -hmm. a very terrifying clinical situation mm -hmm. where you don't know what's happening mm -hmm. um, and it's fairly common so mm -hmm. that was kind of a reaction to that mm -hmm. where you'll see like the expression is very like oh my god I don't know what's happening it's like you know mm -hmm. um, portraying that and the cranes again representing the hope and the hopeful feeling that you have mm -hmm. um, so that that piece is well the show is mostly about that mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, also there is one particular work which is which also uh, alludes to you know uh, abortion and a uh, female infanticide, and um, I think it's part of which one the the carpet. Yeah, can you go back? Can you go back? This one. Yeah. So yeah, I mean you know a lot of these matters are not discussed openly. Um, and so can you tell us uh, about, again, you've used a lot of symbolism within this work. I feel like we totally skipped over the slides. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. This, this is actually uh, the digital process of mm -hmm. how I paint. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot like, you know, the washes that you just saw in the traditional format. So digitally, it's like, you know, applying color, putting the washes, and then slowly, layer by layer, building it up. Uh, now coming to what the image is about. Um, this was actually the first one from the series. And it's called Specimen, which is pretty much how you feel, because you're 
just going through a lot of tests and there are people trying to figure out what's happening. Um, and then the cherubs up there, like in this original picture, there are actually cherubs there. But while I was painting it, things kind of like, you know, evolve. And I think it was like my dark humor that just kind of wanted those emoji angels up there. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see like each expression is, there's something there. I love expressive portraits, clearly. Um, and then you can also tell it's like from COVID times because of the mask. Mm -hmm. um, again, like that's putting, you know, giving mm -hmm. it a platform of the time and everything. And the magic carpet comes yeah, back. The magic <laughs> so the magic carpet was actually supposed to be the tree of life, uh -huh. which is supposed to be flowing through between her legs. Um, and you see that a lot in Islamic miniature paintings because the concept of the low tree, there's a tree in the seventh heaven uh, where all the people who are God's most loved will be sheltered under the tree. So it was the concept was driven from there. Mm -hmm. There's also the moon and the crescent that come into your portraiture. Uh, one specifically, which is, uh, you know, where you are sitting on the moon. It's a portrait of yourself. It's called the nest. Uh, can you tell us more about it? So I think fertility has always been related to the cycles of the moon. So it's like a very feminine representation of celestial bodies being connected. And I think that's where the imagery came from. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used it in different formats just to kind of, you know, whatever is required to adjust the narrative at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just throw this out to the audience if there are any questions or, um, yeah, any thoughts. Thank you for showing, sharing your work with us. This is really wonderful. Mm. Uh, Thank you. Can you go on to the Shadow Hound slide? For yeah, me? sure. I'm not even, wait. Oh, you noticed, huh? <laughs> I love that you noticed that. That's like just me being a little, you know. <laughs> so it says Amul Payag. Payag is the artist who actually painted this original one. And when I altered it, I kind of said, it says Amul Payag or Mahnoor, which is and Mahnoor, which is just my way of being like, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, coming back to the representation and everything. Um, yeah, so that's. And another question about this. In what was the process of kind of altering the image? And how much of it did you have to like painstakingly <laughs> actually replicate? So I think mostly just the portrait. Um, and then I did uh, do some of the details with the horse, just because um, I think the eyes were I wanted to do it a little more, uh, have brighter mm -hmm. eyes. So, um, but other than that, it's pretty much the original. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Sarah. Um, sticking with the, these two works, I wonder, I don't know if how sacred a, a work, the original, is considered, and I wondered, are you breaking any taboos? Are you risking the ire of uh, art lovers? Um, or is this just accepted? Honestly, even if it's not accepted, I think it's time it should be. I mean, that's the whole point, kind of changing the narrative. But have you, have you provoked any, any Not reactions? yet. Okay. So I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> so nothing so far. So far, we're good. Mm -hmm. I think all societies are struggling with gender equality. Did you meet with a lot of opposition in, in, in Pakistan with regard to this image? So no, I strangely haven't. But that's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Um, I think that's what's happening socially everywhere, even in Pakistan. Uh, people are realizing we do have, like, there's a women's march, which is called Aurat March which is kind of about a feministic point of view where 
for equal rights again. So the movement isn't just limited here, it's also happening in Pakistan. So there's actually a lot of support for such images. And women are acting out and they're like, you know, we need equality. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, I think it's pretty well received. Uh, just because the time is such. I'm sure if it was uh, 100 years ago, I'd probably get a lot of Trouble. ire. <laughs> yep. Is there anything you're not able to achieve digitally yet that you wish you could? Sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> Sorry, is there anything you're not able to achieve digitally yet in unit tours that you wish you could? And is there something mm -hmm. you're able to achieve di digitally that you couldn't otherwise? That's actually a really good question. Um, so digitally was a lot easier because it's convenient and I feel like I have more control over it. When, it, when you're painting with a Vasli paper and a squirrel hair brush, it's like the medium in itself does control the narrative. You know, If I'm putting too much paint, it's going to crack. If it's too much water, the paper is going to get a little raw. Um, and that automatically kind of controls how your work's going to turn out. Um, not to say that one is better than the other. I love both. But now that I've been working on the digital aspect more, I'm actually kind of missing the organic way, you know. Um, but both have like different, um, like digitally, it's like, it's never ending. Again, because you have so much control, you can just like change everything. Um, so yes, there's still a lot that I haven't explored, which hopefully I'm planning on. Um, sorry, I just want to ask you, Manur, so in some of the works over the digital prints, you've also painted. Mm -hmm. So now there are multiple layers within your work, wherein we're seeing a, a process to create the work initially, then the digitization, and then again, you are layering it with paint. So. Um, I think aesthetically, um, when you're painting digitally, there's a difference when you print it, which is common knowledge, but clearly I wasn't familiar with it. So every time the print did come out, if I didn't feel right about it, and a lot of detail got lost in it. So I would go back in with paint over the print um, just to get it to a point where I'm comfortable with it. Um, yeah, so that's it's been an interesting process because it's like again layering. Mm -hmm. And when I initially started di uh, digitizing it, the first one was actually a hand drawn sketch, and I took a photograph of it and put it mm -hmm. in a digital app, right? And then mm -hmm. painted over it. Um, so, yeah, there are like layers in that too, mm -hmm. right? And there's one particular work uh, called Eve's Punishment, wherein um, the body form of the woman almost becomes like a string puppet, as if you know she can be manipulated or played around with. So uh, we also see this in uh, another interactive work wherein you're actually meant to touch the work. And uh, can you tell us more about this piece, this interactive piece? So they're articulate dolls, and the idea is that everyone go, and please do if you haven't already, go move them around. Um, it's meant to be a self-reflectory, uh, um, sorry, thank you, moment where, you know, it's really fun manipulating the doll. But if you really think about it, you're moving something against its, you know, wishes or permission or whatever. Um, so it's kind of like an insight into how manipulating someone else's narrative is something that we're so comfortable with and kind of enjoy it at some level also. Um, so I'm hoping that people would realize that, you know, that's not how it should be and just be more conscious of such things. It, yeah, sorry. Um, so do you think that uh, it's now easier to kind of capture more complex form of picture through digitization than the paper one? That's a good question. Um, it is actually, in a way. Like I said, because you have more control, um, so you can actually manipulate it more. Um, and that does give you that freedom to you know, uh, make those tweaks and changes and kind of get to a point where you know, you really want to be and it's exactly there. Because with paper, 
like I said, it does kind of have its own power and it will take you where it will take you. Um, so yes. What's the time, like, if you have to do it through papers? Oh, uh, wow. Well. <laughs> that would take a, that it will take a long, long days time. Or it's 20 days. Or so that's another uh, thing with the traditional uh, process because you're going to put in six hours and you're probably just going to get like a one by one block done. Um, with the digital uh, digitization, it's like a lot easier and your time's cut in half. Um, so, and n so again, the convenience coming back to that, A, you can send the work around, you'll have more, um, you'll connect with more people through the work because it's easier. And then also the speed of creation will be like a lot faster. Um, so more work to share. Yeah, that's definitely a plus point. So if you want, wants to buy you digital print, how it is possible? So it's uh, limited uh, prints. I'm not, it's not a lot of, uh, it's not like you just keep printing it. It's limited prints because I feel like that's another thing. You don't want it. It's important because the work is kind of sacred in a way, right? You want to limit it and not, and because I'm painting over most of them, they're all different in their own, technically. Um, but yeah, so I guess it's like a combination of both. There are a lot of uh, mythological underpinnings, like wherein you're taking uh, inspiration from, uh, for example, Adam and Eve, Eve herself, mm -hmm. or in other works, you know, you are taking inspiration from certain myths. Um, is this an interest of yours that you've kind of built over time? Um, how do these inspirations come about to be? So that's like very fascinating because usually people uh, view areas as like bubbles, but that's not how it is. Like growing up in Pakistan, um, I was very aware of what's happening. I knew about other myths. We were studying them. It's not like you're cut off from the world, really. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those influences do, you know, um, they do show up in the work. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's a personal interest as well as having that globalized, you know, awareness. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of both. Like, especially uh, the feminist forms that uh, are like the string puppets, they remind me of these folk traditions uh, from Gujarat called Katputli, wherein there are these social dramas that are created through for children and for adults yeah. through um, string puppets. Uh, is there a similar practice, uh, I guess, in Pakistan as well? I mean, it's the same area, It's the same area, so, but now yeah. in contemporary times, yes, we do, do have you have uh, the string puppets? We do, we yeah. do. And I think that's also an interesting way because at one point it's like the same area that just got divided. Mm -hmm. And so both areas have kind of, you know, taken the art form in a different direction. So that's also a very fascinating journey to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in the south of India, you also have these uh, leather puppets called Tholu Bomalata. Wow. And uh, they kind of light up from the back. They're made out of leather. Uh -huh. And uh, then there are these social dramas that happen. Uh, and of course, the female protagonist is kind of uh, sometimes shown in a very um, comical way. Mm. You know, uh, wherein there are certain um, societal, and, yeah, you know. uh, societal probably they want to pass on some messages, uh, societal messages that are passed on through these kind of enactments. Uh, so it's just interesting that you are almost, you know, transforming here, the you know, in in Payag's portrait. Now it's woman on horseback. Now suddenly the woman becomes a string puppet. And uh, so there's this kind of evolution of the body form in your work. Um, I think a lot of it is humor related also. Like mm -hmm. Eve's punishment is kind of like, you know, um, a lighthearted version of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really essential and it's mm -hmm. quite important in my work. Um, I think 
it's a good way of like reaching out and trying to connect with people. Mm-hmm. Once I pull them in with the image and the colors, then the serious stuff starts. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, I think that's a really important narrative for me. Mm-hmm. Any more questions? Yes, Joanne. Speaking of that, yes. um, I wanted to ask you to say more about the image that's, I'm sorry, I can't remember the title of it, with the white sheet. And the woman, uh, could you interpret that for us? Yes. Um, so that's actually the one on the promotion, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So this was um, before this. Yeah. So this image was a time when I was going through a lot of tests, and they were trying to figure out uh, why I'm having miscarriages, and they couldn't really figure it out. So I think for me, at one point, it all just blended into one. Um, And I think the best way was like to just kind of separate my headspace from the actual clinical aspect of it. Um, So the divide is actually very clear there um, with her just like, you know, in the flowers and the blooms. And, you know, there's the white sheet there, which is representative of the you know, hospitals, and then there's a kidney tray right below it, which isn't in, in this image. But so kind of like a dichotomy between, you know, the two. There's also little uh, little grass growing on the sheets. Uh, can you tell us more about that? And like, she almost looks like she's posing for the cover of a Vogue magazine or something, um, like but that. probably like, going through all of her pains and sufferings underneath the sheets. Um, yeah, well, what can you tell us? About the grass, again, like, um, it's called bloom. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much, you know, mm-hmm. the bunches of grass mm-hmm. on the sheet mm-hmm. are representative of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with the pose, again, I think that was more like, thank you for saying that, though, mm-hmm. the Vogue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's just to show that she's not really present, kind of like a you know far away mm. expression. Mm. So that's mm. what the look was. Mm. And the several hands. Yeah, so that's what that's what it feels like. There's mm. several hands. There'll yeah. be some injecting stuff in, and there'll be some fixing something up. So right. that's just a representation of that. Yeah. It's not about the art, but I'm curious about your personal history and journey from Lahore to Mumbai. Uh, Lahore to uh, Rhode Island? No, to Mumbai. Oh, I, I'm not from, I'm from Lahore, she's I'm, from, I'm Mumbai. from Mumbai. <laughs> and yeah, we get together here. <laughs> yeah, we met here through yeah. Holly. Um, but I did visit India, um, but I was mostly on the Agra side because we crossed Vaga border, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what about your journey from uh, Lahore to here? Uh, wow. Okay, so basically we got married and within three weeks we moved. Uh, and we were in Chicago, which was initially like a, it was my first move away from home. So it was a little alienating initially. And I think I have a series in the middle, which is about, you mm-hmm. know, people dealing with Um, alienation and isolation and the effects of that. Mm -hmm. Um, At that point, I didn't really realize it. But later on, when I look at the portraits, I'm realizing there's a little bit of me in all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, But I like to think that once you adjust and relocate, Mm -hmm. um, it takes a while, but are we getting the eyes? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, uh, but it, it was difficult initially, but I think we're very adaptable human beings, you know, mm-hmm. we just make the most of it. And now it's weird going back, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I completely mm-hmm. fit in back home or here. So it's like kind of in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an interesting, um, welcome to being an immigrant. Mm-hmm. Any more final thoughts or questions? Yeah. I just have a quick question about the art. Mm-hmm. Um, do the sunflowers have any significance or meaning? So, 
Yes, actually they do because sunflowers face the sun, right? And again, coming back to the celestial bodies, so the sun is, you know, um, life-giving, which was pretty much why the sunflowers are mostly, majority of the flowers I've used is sunflowers, kind of, again, a representation of like, you know, creation and evolution. So I'm glad you noticed that. Thank you. I love flowers. Oh. I, I think that's a great way to end for today's, yeah, is to sort of Thank think you so about much, the flowers. Everyone Thank you all for so coming. much.